The topic given to me today was revolution. After much mulling, I realized that I have absolutely nothing to say about the topic. It's a rather egoistic topic. So I guess what I'm going to do today, instead of like using the word revolution, I'm going to use the word change. And I'm going to talk about my life and my obsession with the city of Manila and what my foundation called Viva Manila is trying to do to change the city of Manila, either through its perception or physically. So today I'm going to do a little bit of a Philippine, I'll give you like a short, very short Philippine history lesson. And then I'll talk about what Viva Manila does and what we're trying to do to revolutionize or change downtown Manila. Let's start with the seal of the city of Manila. I'm sure you guys probably know this seal. It looks very familiar because it's also the same seal as that of the presidency of the Philippines. This is the same seal of Malacanang Palace. But also this is the same seal as San Miguel Beer, which is why it looks really, really familiar to all of you. So it's going to go back to the year 1571, back when King Felipe, the guy who we are named after, sent this guy named Miguel Lopez de Legazpi out on an expedition from Mexico, and he discovered the city of Manila, Maynilad. And this, as you can see, is the oldest known map of the city of Manila, painted by a Portuguese sailor in the 16th century. And if you look at this map, you'll notice that the walls of Intramuros are very thin compared to the ones that you've seen today. Because Intramuros was not made out of stone. Back then, Intramuros was completely made out of bamboo, like the house that you see in the back. Because bamboo architecture is really the only Filipino architecture. Actually, if you go to any province, you'll see that most of the buildings that are not made out of bamboo, the only solid block building will be that of a Catholic church. Everything else is a Nipah hut. So, actually, the concept of permanent architecture is colonial. And you can even see this sort of colonial and multicultural influences upon Filipino traditional architecture. So this is a picture of downtown Manila in Binondo, Plaza Cervantes, now where the BPI is located. And these houses that you see here are organic structures, bottom parts made out of adobe or coral, top parts made out of hardwood, seashells as windows, and roof made of clay tiles. But you're also looking at architecture that is a mix between the East and the West, between Spanish and the Orient. Because until today, who are the people in the Philippines who own every hardware store? The Chinese. <laughs> so what you're actually looking at are Chinese hotung houses that have been converted to Filipino houses by incorporating Western elements. So here you can see that these houses down in Binondo are actually Western in design, Chinese in its construction, but making it completely Filipino. All about East and West. And the reason why we're East and West is because of trade. Back then, there was this thing called the Manila Acapulco Galleon trade where goods from China would come to Manila, transfer boat, go across the Pacific Ocean to Acapulco in Mexico, then over by Duncan to Veracruz, and across the Atlantic Ocean to the Canary Islands, and then over to Seville in Spain. And the Manila Acapulco Seville, this is how Europeans got ivory and how they got porcelain. And this is how we made money, through trade. And this trade between the East and the West is also apparent in the people of Manila. Now, this is a traditional 19th century photograph of the Filipino Ilustrado. Well, if you look at the bottom of the photograph, the bottom of the photograph says that this is a traditional Filipino family called Una Familia Mestiza Española, a Spanish Mestizo family. But if you look closely at the picture, who here looks Spanish? As you can clearly see, the only thing that looks Spanish is the chair. So once again, East and West, it's all about genetic denial. But what also made Manila very interesting was also because of its ecclesiastical and religious significance. What made Intramuros significant to us is because it was where the heart of Philippine belief systems that were Christian started. Intramuros was known for its seven cathedrals, the Manila Cathedral, the Ateneo de Manila, the San Agustin Church, Santo Domingo, the San Sebastian. And these churches actually, until this very day, resonate within our traditions. Because when you go to Mass or church on Maundy Thursday before Easter, how many churches are we supposed to visit? Seven. And the reason why is because Intramuros had seven churches. It was an ecclesiastical pilgrimage city where you would go to Intramuros and walk around the city and visit all seven cathedrals. Today, we have to get into a car and go around and then pass by the mall to do our visita ecclesia. <laughs> 
So you can see Intramuros was basically rooted in Catholic traditions. And then came the 20th century and the coming of the United States. And when the Americans came, Manila completely changed as well. And this little tiny city by the mouth of the Pasig River called Intramuros, this heart-shaped walled city, now expanded out through this avenue called Quezon Avenue to a place called Capital City, now known as Quezon City, out towards Sampaloc, out towards Pasay, and Makati. So Manila really grew with the coming of the United States, simply also because the order had changed. Trade had, ta had taken a different direction. And you can see here in Escolta also the coming of the American influence. So these traditional hotung houses that have been given a European twist now have electricity. As you can see, the Manila Black Pancit brought over by the United States. And all of a sudden, words were in English. And we had things like ice cream, things like automobiles, and a tram. And even the architecture changed. And these little houses that were made out of organic materials were now replaced by high rises, meaning six stories, that were done in Art Deco style, having air conditioning, elevators by Otis, and glass windows. Ooh. But also the architecture would change, and now we are trying to copy more American styles. So this house is pretty much now where Aristocrat Restaurant on Ross Boulevard stands. So you can see that now we were beginning to look more like California. The influences of San Francisco's architecture and that of California started coming to Manila. Manila and San Francisco are actually twin cities. They have a presidio, we have Fort Bonifacio, right? They had a tram, we had a tram. But also the United States also brought automobiles. And, as you can see from this photograph, we were driving on the British side of the road back before World War II. The only reason why we drive now on the American side is because of World War II. Since the Americans blew up the entire city and we had no more trams, they instead sold us all of their leftover World War II surplus Jeeps. And then we bought it for one dollar each. We decorated it and became the Jeepney. And then, just so that they could accommodate it, the Americans reversed our roads. But also, this liberation of the United States came also with public education. Now, no longer did you have to be a rich Spanish mestizo going to Ateneo, but now, <laughs> no offense to anybody's Ateneo, but now you had places like UP and the Philippine public school system where anybody from any social class can now rise up in society thanks to education. So also the Americans would also liberate the Filipino woman. And so as you can see, we were the first country to actually in Asia give the right of suffrage or voting to women. Actually, we, I mean, the women were given the right to vote in the Philippines ahead of the United States. And you can even see that you know, they were liberated even in their clothing. So now no longer did Filipinas have to wear 10 kilos of cloth every day. They only had to wear 5 kilos of cloth every day. Mm -hmm. But most especially, the United States finally brought over institutions. Before, it was a Catholic church who was in charge of collecting all the money from the people to create civic projects. But now, thanks to the United States and the coming of Senate and Congress and this new entire government system that was secular, not connected to religion, it was now your congressman who was reaching into your pocket to get your money to build these civic projects. And it was even reflected in our architecture. All of a sudden, these grand buildings that were inspired by France and Washington, D.C. started popping up all over Manila. This is Lunetta Park. And all of this was driven once again by trade. But once upon a time, it was China coming to the Philippines, going out towards the West. But now with the United States, it was American goods coming to the Philippines and then going out towards the East, China, Japan, so forth and so on. So we were the major trading port when it came to Western goods before World War II. And as you can see, Manila started expanding. They built this thing called Dewey Boulevard, now known as Rojas Boulevard. The big empty lot that you see right in the middle, that's Harrison Plaza. That's the Admiral Hotel. This is now the CCP, and that's the Yacht Club. That's Manetta Park. And Manila became one of the most civilized cities in all of Asia, if not the most civilized. This is Ermita. So that is the Army-Navy Club. That is the Rizal Monument. And Ermita, as you can see, was completely residential where the Filipino upper class would live. This was Forbes Park before Forbes Park became Forbes Park. And it was all a happy dance. We had a tram system. We had trade. Everybody now was speaking English. We were multilingual. And as I said, Manila was a wonderful mix between the organic, the inorganic, the east and the west, the old and the new. It's not one of the world's most beautiful cities. But unfortunately, this dance with the United States, as I'd like to call it, did come at a price. Because in reality, the only reason why the United States really took over the Philippines is not because they were a benevolent, for any benevolent reason, but only because of military strategy. Uh, strategy. They needed us to be the entropo, from, to Asia from the United States. They needed us for Clark Air Base 
and Subic Naval Base, period. And unfortunately, this involvement with the United States got us involved in this thing called World War II. And in February of 1945, right at the close of the war, when General Douglas MacArthur came to Manila to liberate us from General Yamashita, they both fucked up the city of Manila. <laughs> that is an American tank going through Fort Santiago, not a Japanese tank. The Japanese were in charge of killing everybody by hand. It was the United States who bombed everything and they destroyed Intramuros in just four hours. So as you can see, the beautiful city I told you was now gone. And everything just became memory. And this is really where I think Manila took a turn. World War II is the unknown part of Philippine history that no Filipino has addressed yet. Manila was not always this ugly. We had great international help. And it was really when Manila's trauma started, because if people can be traumatized by something in their life, like rape, I believe entire cities can also be traumatized by something that they don't resolve. And my moment, I believe, is World War II. Because check this out. This is Manila in World War II. This is Manila in World War II. This is Manila last week. <laughs> <laughs> Manila World War II. Manila World War II last week. Manila World War II. Manila World War II. Manila today. Right? And it was this moment that Manila started getting paranoid and when, and when demographics would shift. But even then, a lot of beauty still remains. I mean, this is Manila City Hall in World War II. This is Manila City Hall today. Malate Church in World War II. Malate Church today. The Metropolitan Theater. Metropolitan Theater today. Rojas Boulevard, as you can see, is a field. And that's now what you see today. But as I said, it was very difficult for Manila to rebuild itself because of the absence of intramuros. There was no longer any religious significance. So after the war, we tried rebuilding the city of Manila through commerce, through trade. We started building, rebuilding Escolta, rebuilding Avenida de Zal. But without intramuros, there's really no reason why anybody would have any spiritual connection to this particular, this particular space in the city of Manila. And people started moving out started going out towards places like Cubao and New Manila. That's why it's called New Manila. And then places to like Makati and Forbes Park, Magallanes Village. And they created the new Intramuros, the new walled gated communities of Forbes Park, gated community of Better Living, gated community of Merville, gated community of the Greenbelt 1, Greenbelt 2, Greenbelt 3, Greenbelt 4, Greenbelt 5. These are all controlled spaces. So now, after the war, Filipinos start becoming paranoid about the city and creating their own fortresses in which to protect themselves. And that's literally why Manila is a city of walls rather than anything else. But, I tried, but a woman tried to save it, and a woman tried to help it out, named Imelda Romualdez Marcos. Okay, this batshit crazy woman. <laughs> but it's a fine line between brilliance and batshit crazy who back in the 1970s uh, created an institution called the Metro Manila Development Authority. And it was the Metro Manila Development Authority of which she was the head that became the informal governor of the city of Manila. So now all of this madness after World War II, she tried to rein it in by creating a governing body of the 17 cities that we have. Quezon City, Pasig City, Makati City. She now combined all into one and created the Greater Metro Manila, of which she was pretty much the queen of all of that. Okay? And she built things like the Cultural Center of the Philippines, she created the most technologically advanced airport for 1979. She created the LRT, which is still better than the MRT. And she wove everything together by creating this street that would become her downfall, EDSA. So there was attempts to rationalize and create a logical Manila. But unfortunately, another person came along named Claudia Aquino. And Claudia Aquino in 1976 made the horrible mistake of rewriting our constitution, wherein now, the MMDA, instead of becoming the governor of all of Manila, became the maid of all 17 cities. And this is the mess that we see today. 17 cities fighting for one another with a story that needs to be told. So it's pretty much, I think, like a halo-halo, where all of these confluent things become a greater whole. And now I'm just going to really do quickly of what my organization, Viva Manila, is trying to do to revive the city. So what we're trying to do is try to create livability, and then we try to unite organizations like the CCP, Intramuros, National Museum, all of these different confluent agencies. We collaborate with them to create the more unified Manila. And we started doing that by creating our first website called the Viva Manila website, where when all of these agencies can now go to the public, because there's enough things going on. There's more things going on in downtown Manila than any mall in, Manila, in, in, in the city. 
except that nobody knows where these interesting things are happening. And the Viva Manila page now puts them all together. And then we also try to get people involved by crowdsourcing. So we crowdsourced our logo, and those were pretty nasty. <laughs> and our winner is a former member. Volunteer, what can I say, right? It's free, right? And our winner was a man named Vince Africa of Team Manila who created our Viva Manila logo. So we engage the public. And now we also decided to, to create collaborations with art galleries. Because we believe that art is the best way to revive a neighborhood. So we throw these performance art events in downtown Manila in a place called 1335 Gallery, which is an old art deco building in Ermita, wherein we have performance art, we have conferences, and just like A-Space, create a creative community that will come down. Because you need creative people to improve an economy. Trust me, the artists come first. The corporate douchebags come later. <laughs> right? I mean, look at Soho, look at Malate. All started by artists and ruined by the corporate entity. So aside from artists, we also engage um, uh, the gay district of Orosa. Because although everybody left Manila, all, we don't have Philippine Airlines anymore. We don't have Shell anymore. We don't have nightclubs. None of you guys go to Malat anymore. But the gay community still remains. So we try to do is try to collaborate and expand the markets. The gay clubs of Malat, they were coming up to us and saying, nobody comes down here anymore. So we said, diversify your market. Not everybody is this sort of club-going person that you know, likes to take ecstasy until 4 AM. So we introduced them to this group called Diversity, which is a, I guess a group of like overweight gay men. I guess it's like, and we said, these guys don't have a home. Let's create a home for these people. And so the clubs there started throwing Diversity Night, bring down food trucks because they like to eat. And before we knew it, more than 400 new people started coming down to Manila every week. So it's all about engaging and collaborating and improving upon markets that already exist. So as along with that, we also decided to bring in the girls. Because there's no lesbian bar in Manila at all, period. I don't know what lesbians do in Manila. I don't know what they say, home and bake bread? I'm not quite sure. So we created this uh, lesbian night where they had fashion shows, they had a Rampa Fatal contest, and once again, we created a community that already existed and expanded upon. And then we started working with the Business Owners Association of Escolta and Ermita. With all of the business owners, we started doing things like collaborating with restaurants, throwing brunches, and creating staycation packages for other people of Manila. So if you're from Quezon City or from Makati, you can stay overnight in Manila and they'll give you a discount. Because we really believe if I can't convince any of you guys to come down to Malate, how the fuck am I going to convince somebody from Denmark? Manila has to be used by Manilenios first. So uh, along with that, we collaborated with a group called 98B. These people are wonderful. We work on their own. We just help promote them. And they throw a Saturday art market, much like the Legaspi market, in an abandoned building in Escolta. And once again, it's bringing more people. Open door walking tours, of which this Sunday is our last one for the month. It's a walking tour that's not really much about history, but more about reacquainting people with neighborhoods. Because a lot of people don't know how to use a city. We're so used to going to a mall that nobody even knows how to get from one side of Manila to another unless they're going from one mall to another mall. So what we do now is that we now bring people downtown. We start them off at the MNDA Park where people walk around and pretty much learn how to use the city. They know how to use crosswalks. They learn how to not step on the grass. And we walk people all around the neighborhood to art galleries, heritage restaurants, heritage hotels. And every month we get at least around, so I guess this month we had almost 1,000 people already coming to our tours. And that's 1,000 people who have not gone to Old Manila at all. Once again, creating new markets. And then, Ross Boulevard Development, another people we collaborated with. This is actually done by the Department of Tourism and the DPWH. We just kind of help in consultations early in the game. So this is not really our project, but a separate project. But I just want to show you the good news. So Ross Boulevard is now being redeveloped for APEC. And now they will use plants on Ross Boulevard that are seawater friendly, so that it doesn't need to be watered by using things like Talisay, Beach Morning Glory, Pandan, and planting it all over Rojas Boulevard and creating rational um, seating, rational plazas. And guess what? It's done. So come on downtown and then you can see that actually Rojas Boulevard, this is happening today. So Manila can't change, guys. This is not plans anymore. That is Beach Morning Glory right there. That is a bike lane. You can now bike on Rojas Boulevard. Okay. And this is Manila Bay at sunset today. No more vagrants. Well, there's vagrants, but you, know, you can't really get rid of them. You can just Photoshop them out, I guess. 
And hopefully, also the Department of Tourism will close down the golf course of Ermita. We're trying to help them out with that and turn the golf course into a public park. Wow. Orange Line, this is a dream that we have. We're trying to get this dream to create rationalization where people can orient themselves. Because the tourist belt is really only CCP to Luneta Park. That's the tourist belt. It's only one line on Rose Boulevard, but nobody knows it. So what we, do to, what we want to do to make people know where to go and what to do is that we will collaborate, as you can see, just only one path, for CCP to Luneta, and create art that will orient people. So that all you have to do is watch out for art made by Leroy New, who will create these sculptures that will be hung on trees, put on floors, put in plant beds. So all you have to do is just look for the orange sculpture, and you will know that you will get from CCP all the way to Chinatown without getting lost. And then we're also going to do a Machuca Path project. This is also now in development. Where in pedestrian spaces in Intramuros, Machuca tile, which is traditional Filipino tile, will now be hand-painted on the floor. And, and, and that will now, people can know, will know when they see it, is a pedestrian walk. And this is, our, this is the second to last thing that we're doing. Our premier project, the Carless Sunday. So we are, both, we are advocating for a bike, uh, a car-free society with Viva Manila. Um, and we're trying to pedestrianize Intramuros and show people how to use it. So every once a month during the dry season, we throw a street fair on the in the city of Intramuros where we lock down General Luna Street. And we now try to make it pedestrian the way that it was before. Check out that guy down there in the white coat. Check it out today. <laughs> As you can see, that's when it's supposed Intramuros was built without cars. Intramuros was built in a period where there was no cars. So we want to bring that back again through the use of street fairs, public art, street food, street performers, and try to create a more inclusive city where people like the rich and the poor can hang out together instead of being completely segregated from one another the way that they do in Legaspi Market and Salcedo Village and places like Makati. <laughs> No offense, Creative Morning. <laughs> okay, isn't that beautiful? That's what Manila is supposed to feel like. We also do the Urban Design Festival. Once a year, Viva Manila collaborates with people and we have a festival where people who are stakeholders in the development of Manila, like the MMDA, architects like Paolo Arcazaran, for one week, we have talks, we have forums, we have concerts, we have open mic improv festivals, all talking about the city of Manila, how to redevelop it, and how to create a more inclusive society. We'll be throwing another one next year. And then this is the last project, the one that is closest to my heart, because it's all about World War II, a moment that nobody really knows about in Manila. And since Manila was destroyed in February of 1945, in just three weeks, everything culminating on February 24, when the US Army completely surrounded Intramuros, gave the Japanese three hours to give up. When the Japanese did not give up in the three hours, the Americans started firing on Intramuros, and our walled city of seven churches was destroyed. So Manila Transito 1945 is a multimedia memorial that happens every last week of the month, sometimes in March, sometimes in February, where I throw a tour, free tour, pay what you can actually, a barter tour, you can trade whatever you want, for around 200 people. And I, stayed, I, give, I tell the story of Manila, and we end up in the Fort Santiago, where there is an art festival where artists talk about Manila, what it was, what it is today, what it could be. And then we have a street fair, a free open air concert where people can have a picnic, installation art, movies, and then we end the night with a ritual. Sometimes it's a traditional ritual from Mindanao, sometimes it's spirit balloons. And we light up 120 spirit balloons to commemorate the 120,000 people that died. That's a lot of people and we release it into the sky to appease the soul of Manila. And this year, we're on our seventh year. And, uh, oh, and I forgot. Yeah, and we really gave it to DMCI. Bye-bye, <laughs> <laughs> and that's Viva Manila. And so that's what we're trying to do to revolutionize the city. <laughs>